Today I'm out here with one of the most hotly anticipated new vehicles in America, the all-new Veloster N. The Veloster is not just the hottest hatchback in the Hyundai lineup, this is the start of something new for Hyundai. They've said that they're making a new performance brand in America called N, and it will contain not just small hatchbacks like this, but also sedans and yes, even crossovers. Starting a new performance sub-brand is nothing short of a monumental task. We don't really see much of that in the automotive world. In fact, we see mainly the reverse. Mazda, for instance, has said that they're not really going to be focusing on absolute performance models like the Veloster N or other upcoming N products. With other manufacturers either abandoning this segment or choosing never to enter in the first place, the Veloster really stands in a segment of one. Because the Honda Civic Type R, the GTI, the GLI, etc., those are all a step larger than this. Versus the regular Veloster or the Veloster Turbo, we get a slightly modified front end. We definitely have a lot of go fast bits like these red trim accents on the bottom of the front bumper. Those continue along to the side. We have LED headlamps up front with distinctive accent strips, a slightly different grill treatment right here, and of course the end badge right there. Overall, I think this looks better than the Civic Type R up front. I know, I know, I just said that you couldn't compare this to a Type R, and then I went ahead and compared it to a Type R. That's because there is really very little else to compare this to. We no longer have the Fiesta in America. That means that we no longer have the Fiesta ST. It is dying a slow death, but it is definitely ending in America. Therefore, all that we really have in the performance small vehicle category are the next size vehicles up because this is a full step above something like a Kia Soul. I'm not talking about size when comparing this to the Soul because this is only a little bit longer than the Soul. I'm talking about overall performance aspirations. Now, in terms of overall size, at 167.9 inches long, this is a full foot shorter than the Honda Civic hatchback and notably shorter than something like the brand new Jetta GLI. There are pros and cons to any vehicle design. Obviously, the pro for having this three-door arrangement is that we have a bigger driver door making it easier for the driver to get in and out of the vehicle if you have room to swing this door wide open. If you don't have a lot of room in those tighter parking situations, then the bigger door could actually be a bit of a disadvantage. On the other hand, not having a door over here on this side is a little bit less practical as far as getting folks into the back, but it does help improve the overall sporty look from the side profile. Out back, we get a variation on the theme versus the regular styling in the Veloster. We have these distinctive tail lamp modules. They are combination LED modules, meaning some of the elements are LEDs, but things like the turn signals, which are amber over here on the right and on the left, and then the backup lights right here, those are incandescent elements. They move the third brake light right here to this double wing spoiler, and then we get these large twin exhaust tips down at the bottom. Hyundai neatly hides the handle for the hatch right here under the rear windshield wiper. That's a great location, I have to say, because it leaves these areas right here at the bottom of the hatch and down here around the bottom of the bumper free from getting scratches from your fingers because you're grabbing this little plastic handle right up there by the glass. It's going to save the overall paint job, I think, on your hatch. For 2019, the Veloster comes in four different performance levels. The base model gets a naturally aspirated four-cylinder, it produces 147 horsepower, and you get your choice of a six-speed manual or a six-speed auto. The next step up from there is the 1.6-liter turbo, which we've driven before. That produces 201 horsepower and 195 pound-feet of torque. You could think of that as the slightly smaller corollary to perhaps the Civic Si. Then we get this engine right here, a 250 horsepower two-liter turbo, or a 275 horsepower 2 liter turbo, we're driving the higher horsepower version today. Both of those tunes of this 2 liter turbo produce 260 pound feet of torque, and they're both mated by default to a six speed manual transmission. Hyundai tells us that a dual clutch transmission is definitely coming for the Veloster, although we don't know exactly when. Based on some of the rumors and prototypes that have been caught out there testing, I expect to see a seven speed DCT under this hood by the end of 2019. That's going to be a big difference between this and the Honda Civic Type R, which is available only with a six-speed manual. I know a lot of folks out there are manual purists, but the simple fact of the matter is this vehicle with a dual-clutch transmission is going to be more efficient and faster 0 to 60. The other big rationale for including a dual-clutch transmission is that, quite simply, more people might be interested in buying one, since there are a lot of people out there that don't know how to drive manuals these days. The 275 horsepower engine tune means that we have the model with the performance package. Personally, I think if you're Veloster N shopping, you should choose that particular option. In addition to the more powerful engine, we get different stabilizer bars, a more aggressive final drive ratio for faster 0 to 60 performance, bigger brakes, and then 235 tires. These wheels and tires are one step above the regular Veloster N, but as we see all around this vehicle, just a semi-step below something like the Civic Type R. Civic Type R uses 245 tires. 
Front seat comfort, I think, is a step above the average performance hot hatch because we have a partial power driver's seat. This has a four-way lumbar support. There's a very tiny control down there on the seat, and then the rest of the seat motions are manual. We also have pretty aggressive side bolstering, but thankfully, this is definitely designed for larger folks. So we have a lot of shoulder room right back here. It's not really tight and constrained like some performance vehicles out there. I think overall, this is a good fit for my six-foot frame. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion. And as we see in a lot of Hyundai vehicles, the driver's seat moves quite far back. That's going to make it a lot easier if you're a taller person and you're interested in something sporty like this. If I put the seat all the way down, I still have about two and a half inches of overall headroom left. We don't have a moonroof in this model. The color on the inside for the N sub brand is blue. So we have these baby blue seat belts here and then blue accents across the cabin. Hopping into the back seat is pretty easy because the Veloster N does not delete the third door that the Veloster has been known for. So this is not exactly a two-door coupe, although it looks like it from the driver's side. This asymmetricality has always been an interesting feature of the Veloster. We have a roll-down window over here on the passenger side rear, and this window opening is larger than the window over there on the driver's side. Although the Veloster is a subcompact vehicle, overall legroom is fairly generous. With this front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall, I have about half an inch to three quarters of an inch of legroom left. And if I sit back here, I do have to crane my head slightly to one side, but I could probably do this for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. This is the kind of vehicle where you could, if you needed to, take four adults to lunch. It's worth noting that in terms of overall headroom in the back, this is really not that far off many compact vehicles in America, even though again, this is one step smaller. Moving to the inside, you can see those blue seat belts for all four passengers. This is a four seat vehicle only. And you'll notice that the passenger side B pillar is definitely closer to the front of the vehicle than the driver B pillar, again, because of that asymmetrical three door design. We have the N logo right there on the front seat backs, some contrasting blue stitching, and this very unique fabric that has sort of a honeycomb like look to it. Pretty aggressive bolsters on the seat side and seat back cushion. As you'd expect, in an inexpensive vehicle, the passenger seat does not have the four-way lumbar support that we see on the driver's seat. Also, as you'd expect, in an inexpensive vehicle, we have a lot of hard plastics going on up front, so this is the same sort of build quality that we see in the base version of the Veloster. Excellent panel gaps, but we don't find the soft touch plastics that we'd see in larger vehicles. Moving over to the middle of the dashboard, we find this touchscreen infotainment system that sticks up a little bit off the dashboard, a center channel speaker behind that, two large air vents, and then some physical controls for the single zone automatic climate control, and then the infotainment system itself. Some of the trim that is red in the Veloster Turbo again becomes blue in this model. As with other Hyundai products, this infotainment system supports smartphone integration, as you see right there. All the usual basic features that we'd find in a modern Hyundai vehicle. And then we have this N mode display. This loads an awful lot faster than the performance pages we see in modern FCA vehicles. This screen gives us G-Force indications, performance tires. We can also see a history of the engine power. Now, this is, uh, we have to go quite far back here because this has been parked for some time, filming and idling. It would actually give you a little graph of the horsepower output, torque output, turbo pressure, etc. But the big thing I wanted to show you is this custom option right here. You can access the custom mode via some buttons on the steering wheel that I'll show you in a bit, but this is how you adjust the custom mode. We can choose normal, sport, sport plus for the engine, rev matching feature right there, off normal, sport, sport plus. You can choose how the electronically actuated limited slip differential works. That is one of the excellent features that we have on the end model. You can also adjust the exhaust sound, whether you want it to be really raucous and pop a lot as you're shifting, or whether you want it to be a little bit quieter so as not to disturb your neighbors. Then on the chassis option, we have options for the adaptive suspension system, three different modes right there. We can also adjust the steering between those three different modes. And then lastly, you can adjust the stability control system, whether you want it to be off, you can say really right there, you can actually disable that, sport or normal. And again, we can just one click actuate that from a button on the steering wheel. Until we see that dual clutch option, the only transmission on offer again is this six speed manual transmission as you can see there. We have reverse over to the left and then up. That is not exactly my preference. I prefer reverse all the way over to the right and then down, but I was able to get adjusted to that pretty quickly. We have a button right over here to turn off the stability and traction control system. We press once to get it in the sport mode and then press and hold to turn it completely off. And then we have some button blanks right down there. The instrument cluster is very similar to the rest of the Veloster lineup. We have a large tachometer and large speedometer there. As we engage the different drive modes, this display will show you what's going on, but it's not going to give you as much detail as the infotainment system will now. 
At the bottom of the LCD, we get the indication that we have rev matching enabled. We have the drive mode selected right there in the middle, and you can see that we have ESC Sport. If I move to the custom mode, you'll see that we have this little message right here. That's because I have to press and hold the button since I did program custom mode to disable stability and traction control system. See, we get some additional messages there, and now we're in that custom mode. We can also cycle between normal sport and eco modes, just as you'd see in most Hyundai products. Moving out to the steering wheel, I'm a little surprised that we don't have a flat bottom steering wheel. Maybe they're saving that for another end model in the future. Instead, we have a round wheel, pretty decent sport grips up top. It's nice and thickly rimmed. Moving in a little bit closer, you'll notice the big difference between this and other Veloster steering wheels. It's these two blue paddles on the left and on the right. The one on the left allows us to select normal sport and eco drive modes. The one on the right is for N and the N custom mode. How different are the three exhaust modes? Let's take a listen. The operation of these mode paddles is very similar to the M buttons that we see on modern BMW products. On the right side, we find the buttons for the cruise control system. This button toggles through the various displays in that multifunction LCD, including an additional gauge where you can see oil temperature, torque, and turbo pressure. We choose options with this toggle right here and click OK to enter. If you want to rev match, you can hit this rev button on the steering wheel. You'd use this in a drive mode where you didn't normally have rev matching enabled. So for instance, if I hit this drive mode button over here, move over to normal, and then I hit the rev button, that will engage the rev matching feature. On the left side of the steering wheel, we have the buttons for the infotainment system, track up, down, volume up, down, mode, voice command button, and then some dedicated phone buttons. Let's get our performance numbers out of the way right up front. In my testing, the Veloster N went from 0 to 60 in 5.4 seconds. This is the model with the performance packs. So this is the most power you can get out of the Veloster. As far as 0 to 60 scores go, supposedly professional drivers could get as low as 5.2 seconds in this model, but most folks are going to be around 5.5 because, just like most of you out there, I'm not a professional driver. So I'm a little bit slower on the clutch and the shifter than those professional drivers that are getting nearer to 5 seconds. Bearing in mind that the driver is the biggest factor when it comes to 0 to 60 times in a vehicle that has a manual transmission, this is right around the same 0 to 60 time as the Honda Civic Type R. For some folks out there, they may get faster 0 to 60 times in that Honda. Some folks may be faster in this one. Just depends on how fast you are dancing on the pedals. Now, if Honda does end up putting their 7-speed dual-clutch transmission under the hood, this is probably going to be faster than the Civic Type R because the robot can shift faster than you can. Any way you slice it, this is definitely quick for an inexpensive vehicle. Remember, this is under $30,000, and we have absolutely excellent performance. We also have excellent stopping distances. In our testing, this stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 110 feet. That's a little bit shorter than the Veloster Turbo, and basically the same as the last Civic Type R that we tested. That shouldn't surprise you too much because this is actually about the same curb weight as the Civic Type R. And that surprised me a little bit because this is notably smaller. This is a subcompact hatchback. The Civic is a compact hatchback. With very similar curb weight, the two vehicles handle relatively similarly as well. Although the Civic Type R does outhandle this a little bit because it does have wider tires. 235 tires on this model, 245s on the Honda Civic. The Honda Civic also has a slightly wider footprint. As this is a subcompact, we have a shorter wheelbase, it is a little bit narrower overall as well. Or when it comes to overall handling, I'm going to give this an A since the Civic Type R and the Golf R both get A pluses. Now we do have those drive mode buttons on the steering wheel and that is a really handy feature because it allows us to combine things like the improved throttle response, that, that popping noise that we get out of there in the rear exhaust, a reason that you might just want to sit here and play on the pedal just so you can hear it pop over and over and over again with the softer suspension available. And of course, if you want to do all of this quietly, you can then adjust this on the fly and choose the normal exhaust note, and then you can have all that fun without the popping exhaust in the back. It makes the Veloster N a great deal quieter both inside and outside the cabin. When it comes to the overall ride quality, I'm going to give this a B plus. Keep in mind that we are comparing this to other performance vehicles out there. So this is definitely not as soft as the regular versions of the Veloster. For a performance vehicle, the ride is relatively well composed. In terms of overall daily driver livability, the Veloster N scores very well. 
something like a Honda Civic Type R, a Jetta GLI, or a Golf GTI, they're not necessarily going to be that much softer than this, even in their softer suspension modes if you have the adaptive suspensions. In our cabin noise test, we clocked the same 73.5 decibels at 50 miles an hour. That is when the vehicle was in its normal mode. If you are in one of the sportier modes of the sportier exhaust note, then things are going to get a little bit louder in the cabin. As always, performance comes at a cost, and that cost for the Veloster N is fuel economy. We've been averaging about 25 miles per gallon or so. That's definitely below the other versions of the Veloster. I suspect that once the dual clutch transmission is available in the Veloster, overall fuel economy will improve. Because if we take a look at the rest of Hyundai's performance lineup in America, the best fuel economy numbers are always with the dual clutch. I'd expected the Veloster N to be fun, but I didn't expect this to be as much fun as it really is. This is certainly a hoot and a half out on your favorite winding mountain road. The amount of grip that we get is incredible. Sure, the Honda Civic Type R may get a little bit more grip, but I actually think this has more personality than that Honda. The snap, crackle, and pop from the exhaust is excellent, and I love the way that you can configure the drive mode and then access those drive modes so quickly from these paddles on the steering wheel. Although price-wise, this is not that far off the Jetta GLI or the Honda Civic SI, this definitely feels much more special. This feels more in the same category as the Honda Civic Type R, but at a lower price tag. Speaking of price tags, let's talk about that now. Bearing in mind that the Veloster is a subcompact vehicle in America, its price tag is right where you'd expect the average subcompact to be, starting at $18,500. But if you want the N model that we were testing this week, then that will start at $26,900. It comes very well equipped with a lot of the features that we talked about here, including the LED lamps, the adaptive suspension, brake-based torque vectoring system, etc. But if you want to go to the next level of performance, which is the one that we were driving this week, that'll set you back $29,000. That gives us the power bump to 275 horsepower, the upgraded brakes, the upgraded wheels and tires. We also get the electronic limited slip differential, which is a really key feature that differentiates the Veloster N from a lot of the competition, whether we're talking about something like a GTI, a Honda Civic, or a Honda Civic Type R. That brings us along to the subject of comparisons. What is the Veloster N? That's a tricky question because it's a three-door, almost coupe, sort of hatchback-like subcompact thing. It's 166 inches long, which puts it about the same size overall as a Volkswagen GTI, but a full foot shorter than something like a Honda Civic hatchback. Even the two-door Honda Civic Coupe seems massive compared to the Veloster, because again, the Veloster is a smaller category vehicle. You'll notice that not just in the length, but also in the width on the inside. And finally, you'll notice that when it comes to the overall price tag, because in some ways, the Veloster N, especially the top-end Veloster N, the $29,000 model, should be seen more as a corollary to the Honda Civic Type R than the Honda Civic SI, except that the price tag is more SI than R. Let's talk about the Honda Civic first. There are a ton of different performance models of Honda Civic. We have the Honda Civic Sport, which is available only as a hatchback. We have the regular turbocharged models of the Honda Civic available in all three body styles, coupe, sedan, and hatchback. Some might not really consider that a performance model, but zero to 60 acceleration times are pretty impressive in that model. Then we have the Civic SI. The SI is available as a sedan or as a two-door coupe only. And then we have the Honda Civic Type R, which is available only as a hatchback. If you're confused by that lineup, it's understandable because Honda's lineup is a little bit on the confusing side. The big thing you need to know here is that the Honda Civic Type R is the most expensive at $35,700. The SI is notably less expensive, the Sport less expensive than that. But which model is the direct competitor to the Veloster N? The reality is that none of them are. The Civic Type R produces more power, but most importantly, it's also bigger. It's a compact vehicle. Uh, the Honda Civic SI, which is available as a coupe, is a less powerful vehicle than the Veloster and doesn't have that same performance level. Now, you can get the Honda Performance Package on the Civic SI, and that will raise it up to some of the performance that we see in the base Veloster N, but definitely not the Veloster N with the performance package. That's still going to be in a different category. Perhaps this is the best way to think of the Veloster N. If you're looking at the Honda Civic Type R and you're thinking, I wish I had something a little bit smaller, something that was a little bit less boy racer on the outside, that's where the Veloster N comes in. I prefer the Veloster styling on the inside and on the outside to what we see in the Honda Civic Type R. I think it just fits my personality a little bit better. And then of course there's the fact that price-wise, it's priced like a Honda Civic SI with a performance pack, not like a Honda Civic Type R. 
That price point is also an important differentiator between the Veloster N and a Volkswagen GTI. Some folks out there would say that the more appropriate cross shop here would be the Golf R versus the Veloster N, but then we're really talking about price categories that are very far apart. The GTI starts a little bit more expensive than the Veloster N, but by the time you've worked your way on up to just an SE trim, that's already more than the top end trim of the Veloster N, and there's still a few more trims above that in the GTI lineup in America. And we're still talking about a vehicle that produces less power than even the base Veloster N at around 220 horsepower. So if you want that next level of performance up where the Golf R sits, you're going to be paying significantly more than the Veloster N. My bottom line with the Veloster N is that it's a great deal more compelling than I initially thought. When this generation of the Veloster came out, we asked for the regular turbocharged version of the Veloster N to do our video set on. We really ignored the Veloster N for the most part. The main reason for that is that I, like many people out there, thought to myself, well, gosh, it's it's not quite a Honda Civic Type R, but it's a little bit more than a Civic Si, and for that price tag, is it really worth it? And my bottom line answer here is yes, I definitely think that the Veloster N is an excellent package. I really love the fact that we have this inexpensive performance vehicle that is an absolute blast to drive. It really is one of the best driving vehicles you can get for that kind of cash in America right now. And the driving control systems have been engineered in such a way that they're highly customizable and you can completely defeat them if you want to. With that simple press of the buttons on the steering wheel, we can change those modes very much like we see in BMW's M products. And you can go for a mode where you completely turn off the electronic nannies in the vehicle, if that's something that you're interested in in your $27,000 car. I think what surprised me most about the Veloster N is just the smile factor that you get while driving it. I haven't had that much fun in a vehicle outside of something like a BMW M5, and the M5 is considerably more expensive. Is a BMW M3 going to be more fun than a Veloster N? Absolutely, without question. But when we're talking about fun factor for the dollar, I don't really think there are many vehicles out there that can compete with the Veloster N. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. And if you were shopping in this segment, would you get something like a GTI, a Veloster N, or a Honda Civic Type R, bearing in mind that the Veloster N is going to be less expensive than either of those options? Let me know down there. Check out our related videos down there at the bottom of your screen as well. If you hadn't already done so, hit that subscribe button. Click up there to the top of your screen if you want to support this channel, and I'll see you next week.